Hello friends and welcome to another day of crochet and crime. My name is Hazy Baby and apparently <laughs> I am a cartoon today. Ta-da! Anyway, I crochet while talking about crime and today I am going to be crocheting Lillian who is my lovely project that I'm doing at the moment. She's all purple and beautiful. Oh, she looks even better in cartoon. How cute of her! Um, and yeah, so I'll be talking about fraud because it's fraud Friday, fraud, 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 Friday, and I have some other stories as well regarding not fraud, but anyway, uh, some musical fraud, and no, I don't mean like the fraud was done to the style of a musical, like they were like, hi, I didn't mean to charge your credit card, but I did, so now you're broke. And it's no joke, because I've got no money and it's not funny. I'm a fraud star. Here's my jazz hands. Okay, yeah, right. It's not that. Okay. It is actually um, fraud regarding the producers of music and the um, accountants of musicians. Two in particular, and both of them Australian, so pfft, that sucks. Um, but yes, and then I will also be talking about regular good old crime. Uh, and crocheting so if you're new to my channel please like and subscribe um, if you would like to have a chance of winning one of my lovely creations then please head on over to my crochet and crime channel on YouTube uh, subscribe and comment and you can go into the drawer to win one a blanket that is not a crime anyway <laughs> thank you so much for your time and effort today and I shall see you soon for YouTube, it's not right now, but if you're on TikTok, then it's when I upload it. Oh, look at my nails. Even my nails look cool. I look so cool as a cartoon. And good. I'm so cute. Okay, friends. Like I said, welcome to another day of crochet and crime. Um, if you're on my YouTube channel, then welcome, welcome. Please like and subscribe. If you're on my TikTok, then go over to my YouTube channel and like and subscribe. Just because, you know, I said so. And you should always do what I say. Uh, because it's important and imperative to do what I say. Anyway, I'm still working on Lillian. And as you can see, she grew again overnight. I know I said that yesterday and I'll keep saying it until she stops growing overnight. Um, the magical crochet fairies crocheted her. Obviously, the magical crochet fairy is me. I'm a magical fairy. Yes, I am. Come fight me. You don't know where I live, so you can't. Ha ha. Um, some of you do. So some of you are my family. But don't come fight me, please. I'm not very good at it. So at the moment, I am turning her into an octagon to make her back into a circle. Because like I said before, I do love the shapes. So these are my new corners. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, and I've got these lovely little things happening here to keep myself. Because it's getting bigger now. And uh, a little bit harder to see as a giant picture. So... Let me stop blabbing and start talking about today's fraud. So first of all, I want to start with my first fraud case. Also, welcome to Fraud Friday. I have three fraud cases for us today and then your good old regular crime. So, sorry, not sorry. I love doing this. I was going to have a day off today and then I was like, oh my god, I'm so addicted to this channel. I need to upload. So, here we are. And I am uploading. What was I doing? Okay, I'm just going to do one... And then a single crochet in all of these all the way along. That was my plan. And I'm sticking to it. Okay, so I don't know how many people on my channel are from Australia and how many people um, are not. So I'll just give a small caveat to this first one. Alrighty, so this first fraud case is a well-known one here in Australia, um, especially in the music industry. Uh, is the case of Guy Sebastian and Guy Sebastian was not the fraudster in the case but a very famous victim so Guy Sebastian is an Australian uh, musician he's an Australian and Polynesian musician actually um, and he won uh, Australian Idol back in the day uh, and he made some really good money when he won Australian Idol and he produced some CDs. Anyway, he's cha he's since changed and his music has evolved, as I do love to see. And he became quite famous overseas in other countries and he is well known today. But any Australians know him as the cute little Polynesian guy who um, had a wonderful afro and who started on Australian Idol. So that's where we know him from. Well, that's where I know him from. And by we... I'm talking about me, and since I am the focus of my myself, 
Uh, that's all that matters, apparently. <laughs> anyway, so back in um, 2000 and hmm, 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 let me think. I think it was the early 2000s, mid 2000s, he started to sue uh, Titus Day. So Titus Day was his producer. His also name, his other name, I think his name is like Titus L something something Day. Anyway, so Guy Sebastian's former manager Titus Day remained free on bail until his sentencing after he was found guilty for embezzling the pop star's money. So the 49-year-old fronted court, as they do, and learned that he'll remain on bail until his sentencing uh, September of 2022. And so he did get sentenced and he was sentenced and um, convicted of embezzling almost 900000 in royalties and performance fees over a five-year period. He pled not guilty for 47 counts of embezzlement because he was just taking it off the top um, and was found guilty. So he pled not guilty, and he was, but he was found guilty of 34 charges and not guilty of 13. After a week of deliberations, the trial went for seven weeks after facing delays, which included the judge presiding over the case, Peter Zahar. He, unfortunately, he died. He was an old man and he died. So he was Guy Sebastian's former manager, had also been jailed for a total of, drum roll, four years. So he got four years and ordered to repay more than $624,000 um, fraudulently taken from the Australian Idol winner over an eight-year period. So all in all, they worked out that he didn't take close to a million, but uh, were able to convict him of close to um, six hundred and fifty, pretty much thousand uh, dollars of Guy Sebastian's money. Um, which doesn't, I know that might not seem like a lot to everybody because they're all like, ah, oh, but he is a huge famous now and he earns millions of dollars. Yeah, okay, but that doesn't make it okay for this guy to um, embezzle from Guy Sebastian. So we should all feel sorry for him, and I do, because he's actually a really nice guy. Well, from what I've read and from what I've seen. Um, and, yeah, look, so, yeah, oh, that's his name, Titus Emmanuel Day, they put him for behind, so he got sentenced to a maximum of four years in prison, but they told him that his uh, behind bar period will be two years and six months, and he'll be eligible for parole after that. So he has appealed it, obviously, and has gone through the Court of Appeal to try and appeal for it. Anyway, so the 49-year-old's convictions comes after the New South Wales District Court jury found him guilty, like I said, of 34 charges. All charges were committed to financially gain through this inherent in offence, the kind of like offender that used money um, other than Mr. Sebastian's benefit. So, you know, he's the one who sung, he's the one who got up on stage, he's the one who stayed up all night writing lyrics, he's the one who, like, that was his intellectual property, if you will. Um, and therefore, you know, the only person who should be making money from these is Guy Sebastian. Yeah, sure, his producer should be making some money off Guy Sebastian, but, you know, you're not up there on the stage singing, so how dare you take his money? You scumbag! But, you know, it is what it is. Some people suck, okay? Some people suck bad. I just realised I have to put that back in. Okay, so that was Guy Sebastian. Um, yeah, and so he won his case... Um, the, the A-hat appealed in early, let me have a look, sorry. Yeah, he appealed, um, earlier last year, but he was, uh, denied his appeal. But he will be appealing again, obviously, he is trying to say that he didn't do anything. So... Basically, Judge Gardelman rejected claims by day that he used the money to repay commissions and legal expenses and other costs owed, saying there was no evidence to back it up. So this is what he said. He said he took the money to pay for um, commissions and stuff like that. So how these big shows work is the prize money that they win at the end, it's contractual. So they um, are contracted for a single 
and they make a certain amount of money based off that single and the production company gets a lot of it um, producers get a lot of it and the singer pretty much gets a small stipend and um, you know an, an album deal so there's usually no guarantee that they that they will make it big after that so usually once the hype of these shows runs out people forget who they are but um, Kelly Clarkson and uh, Guy Sebastian and um, a couple others have made it really big, like it has been their break. But to make that break, they had to work really, really hard after the fact. So there's lots of pushing their albums, lots of trying to um, create this new brand. And Guy Sebastian has successfully done that. Kelly Clarkson su successfully did it. Um, and kudos to them, hats off. It's a lot of hard work. A lot of people think that art, the music is an art, um, is one of those things where, um, you know, you just have to have talent. Well, having talent is one thing, but um, capitalizing on that talent and knowing what your talent is worth is another thing. And then getting a break is the third thing. So, you know, there's lots of things that um, makes it quite difficult to get better if you will um to make it big make it big and it's, it's difficult it's no it's not a fun time and yeah so he embezzled this money and i don't think any court in the land that makes me sound very mythical sorry i read a lot of books especially fantasy i don't think any court in the land is going to find him not guilty so let's move on to our next case of musical fraud or fraud from music industries. And this one is kind of related to Guy Sebastian, but kind of not. Okie dokie. So musical industry accountant has been accused from stealing a million dollars from bands. So he is an accountant who gave evidence, ironically, in the previous case, in the Guy Sebastian case. So that's how that's related. He gave evidence on the side of Guy Sebastian. So not on the side of the embezzler, but on the side of the victim. And now he has been charged or accused with and recently charged with siphoning off more than one point something million dollars from several prominent Australian bands. So he went and he he's the accountant. So this time it's the accountant with his hand in their pocket. And he siphoned off more than a million dollars. The exact number is not yet known. And are from Australian bands, which is, you know, the Australian industry, music industry, is a hard enough industry to break into. We pretty much have to become famous somewhere else in the world before we become famous here. And it's ridiculous, but it's true. So his name is Damien Lascombe. So he gave evidence at the at Guy Sebastian's former manager has been accused the company of siphoning money from prominent musicians, including Peking Duck, while a few other musicians may have been affected from the alleged flawed major acts, such as White Sky Music, um, Tame Impala, Vance Joy, Amy Shark, John Butler. Angus and Julia Stone and Guy Sebastian um, were some of the people that were named in that um, that he has been siphoning money from. So poor Guy Sebastian, he's getting hit everywhere. Um, so yeah, so he's been siphoning mo money. He's been accused of siphoning money from um from australian bands and really that's all the information i have about that but he's been accused of it he will front court he will face court and hopefully we will find out more information um but it is just like super sad that these people think that they can just take other people's hard-earned money i mean and they're getting guys they're not getting not paid they're getting well paid they're getting well paid to be the producers of these people they're getting well paid to be the accountants of these people you know they're not like us they're not like you and me they don't just like get paid 130 dollars for putting someone's taxes in they get paid a, a commission and they get paid a lot of money 
and they're trusted. And so the, it's that breaking of that trust that I think is going to really be upsetting for these musicians. And like I said, it's the Australian music industry. It's hard. It's hard to crack into. It's hard to get up there. It's hard to get CDs made. It's hard to get support behind you. Um, I, and I have said this. My husband has been part of bands, many bands throughout the years, and he's been a soundie for many bands throughout the years. And he's got a great love in music. And his problem that he has with the music industry in Australia is that we don't seem to and we don't tend to value our musicians very much. Um, and we only tend to value them once they've made it big somewhere else. Um, yeah, and then we're all like, oh, they're from Australia. Oh, how cool. And it's very frustrating and infuriating. And yes, I am calling out a large population of Australia. And yes, I am generalizing. But um, prove me wrong. <laughs> But that's my opinion. And now I'm going to move away from the music industry because I'll get up on my little high horse again. I know I have lots of horses. This one is for music. Um, and I'm going to be talking about a another con man. This one who stole $25 million from Sydney residents. Isn't that nice? What a nice guy. So... Let us go on. So an alleged con man has been refused bail after he stole $25 million from dozens of mums and dads, investors, so mum and pop investors in Sydney's southwest. Huh, it's going to be one of those really difficult names that I find really difficult to pronounce. So just bear with me. His name is Vincen, Vincenzo. Vocasnio. Vincenzo Vocasnio. I apologize, but I don't really if I got that incorrect. You're a scumbag, and you don't deserve me to say your name correctly. But anyway, his profile said that he was a foreign exchange trader, but New South Wales police alleged that he fleeced millions of dollars from up to 40 investors, mostly people who he knew and lived around in Oran Park. And also friends and family. Look, I'm seeing a running theme here with these fraudsters. They they rip off their friends and their family. Like, how scummy do you have to be that the people you rip off are your own family? What a scum bucket. What a scum bucket, guys. What a scum bucket. So, yeah. Uh, it's alleged that... Uh, I'm just going to call him Vinny told the victims that he invested it in foreign exchange through his business, Triple Cross Investments. But today, a court heard that he allegedly gambled, of course he did, the $25 millions away through personal betting accounts, including sports bets. So, look, I think trading is basically just betting with extra steps as it is. So for me, this is not that big of a, oh, of course he did. Um... No, not that big of a leap, I mean. I mean, my brain's gone. Of course he did. It's because, you know, it's... I mean, I don't care what anyone says. I think that investment trading is a huge gamble. It's a huge gamble. I mean, you've got no guarantee that you're ever going to make any money back from that investments. And pretty much, like I told people who've asked me for financial advice... I mean, don't ask me for financial advice. I am currently crocheting on a crochet channel for free. So I'm obviously not that bright. Um, but... Um, as long as you're entertained, that's all that matters, because I'm entertained. So I think that those kind of fraudy kind of... I think that investment companies are kind of difficult because there's no guarantee. There is no guarantees that you're going to make any money. If you don't invest in the right company at the right time and pull out at the right time, then the likelihood of you making any kind of money is, you know, it's going to be minimal. I say if you're going to put money into investments, don't be expecting it back. Just be, it's the same as putting it in a poker machine as far as I'm concerned. Odds are probably better. But, yeah. And I think that must have been his train of thought. So all Vinny was all like, ah, well, fuck it. In for a penny, in for a pound. And he decided that he was going to spend his money, their money, sorry, not his, on um, sports bets. Obviously, he was not very good at it. So, uh, detectives allege that he operated a Ponzi scheme. So, for those of you who don't know what a Ponzi scheme is, it pretty much means you borrow from Peter to pay for Paul. 
So you steal from one person to pay off investors from another person, but you don't actually pay them back completely. You just give them enough to shut them up. Um, and that's a Ponzi scheme, basically. By using um, yeah, money from high returns to other clients. So he would, he would you know, give them just their returns or... He would, if people asked to pay out, he would, you know, get some more people and steal from them and pay them out. And I think the train of thought that usually happens with these kinds of Ponzi schemes is I think they start out thinking that they're doing the right thing, that they try and get the money back from somewhere or in by some means. And then they think, oh, I'm going to make my family, you know, money and stuff. And then it goes downhill and then it spirals out of control. And then one morning they wake up and they've done a Ponzi scheme. Um, and they're mostly cowards. I don't care what anyone says. I think you have to be pretty cowardly to take money from your own family and then gamble it thinking that you're doing the right thing. So, <clears throat> invest in, investors allegedly trust him with savings between $10,000 and $3 million each. Jeebus, I want his friends. $3 million? So, Carmen detectives uh, began investigating after a 40-year-old went to the Norellan police station last year, claiming that he'd been bashed over. Ooh, he handed over $6.7 million in investments that went badly with a client. The victim... Um, compared his alleged crimes to those of fraudster um, Melissa Caddick. So if you guys don't know who she is, go back to Last Fraud Friday um, and have a look. It's where it's with all of my female fraudsters. This week has male fraudsters. Last week was female fraudsters. And Melissa Caddick is one of those. So she swindled between $20 million and $30 million from family friends in a Ponzi scheme as well before her disappearance. And then they found her foot washed up on a beach um, so yeah, the speculation is that she jumped off the, the gap, which is the cliffs in Sydney. Um, and there's also speculation that she was part of some mob gang and they cut her foot off and blah, 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 blah. But I actually think she just jumped off. She just unalived herself. That's all. Alrighty. So today at a magistrate's told Tweedhead's courthouse, uh, case against Vinny was strong and he was refused bail. Good. Nine News understands that more victims and um, more people, and I do too, might come forward in this case. And so if you have been swindled by this A-hat, then please go to your local police station and let them know. Because bitch got to pay for what he did, basically. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Okay, so they're my three fraud cases for today. Try saying that three times over. Three fraud cases for today. Um, and now I would like to talk to you guys about my regular crime stuff. Not my regular crime, but you know what I mean. Like, I'm not committing the crime, but it is regular crime. Australian crime. I think some of it's not Australian crime, but most of it is. Hold on. Just got to turn this corner. Down on the corner. Out in the street, Billy and the four boys playing, drink some music, tap your feet. I need an iced coffee. Hold on. No, it's regular coffee. I can't afford iced coffee. You guys are funny. Ha 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 I accidentally closed it down. No! Give me a second. Okie dokie. So this next set of stories, I will put in the caveat or the warning, trigger warning, if you will, that these stories are about childhood abuse and the... Um, sexual assault of women and domestic violence. So I don't write the news, guys. I just report it. But I think I should at least let you guys know that that's what I will be discussing and so give you a little bit of a chance to fast forward if this is not something that you're interested in. I have finished with the fraud stuff for the day, so if you don't want to watch the rest of this video, please feel free to move along. But mostly it is... Uh, there's no updates in here, so you're not going to miss anything. It's literally just cases about um, historical rape and childhood abuse such as pedophilia. Alrighty, and a couple of murders, I think. So let without further ado, I think I've given you enough warning and enough time to skedaddle if you want to. Let me start. So a man who drugged women and raped and raped her, a woman, sorry, and raped her for 67 times is jailed in Melbourne. So that's nice. It's nice that he's jailed. So 
a migration agent <clears throat> who drugged a woman and raped her 67 times while she was unconscious has been jailed for nearly three decades, which is great. So Frank Hu, who's 38, was sentenced to 29 years in prison by their county court judge, um, Trevor Wright, today. Uh, Hugh pled guilty to eight charges of rape and three of sexual assault, three of intentionally causing um, injury and one charge of reckless, recklessly causing serious injury for offending involving seven women. So, yeah, that's right, seven, seven women. So he primarily met his victims through companies he operated out of Little Collins Street business in central Melbourne um, and drugged them when they worked or after he arranged employment interviews with them. So he called ambulances for these women. He drugged on four occasions after noticing their conditions deteriorated. One woman spent two days in an intensive care unit after going into cardiac arrest requiring CPR and defibrillation um, to resuscitate her on not one but two occasions he raped two of the women one twice and the other 67 times and the judge said your offending is appalling and must be condemned in the strongest terms his offending was uncovered by the Australian Border Force officials who searched Hugh's phone at the Melbourne airport after he returned from overseas. Now, I love Border Patrol. I especially love Australian Border Patrol. We are one of the hardest countries to get in and out of. And I love, love, love that it's them who found these videos. So he, they found images and videos of semi-unconscious or unconscious women being sexually offended against. And they immediately sent the phone to Victorian police. Uh, the investigation languished as they were unable to identify any of the victims in the videos until obviously they found one. So in late 2018, one of the women contacted police. She believed she'd been sexually assaulted by Hugh, but couldn't actually remember any of the details. One woman contacted police in 2019 and she claimed that she'd been drugged by who and actually figured that out after a lot of therapy and figuring out what the hell was going on. She logged onto his computer, this second girl, sorry. The first girl suddenly remembered stuff. The second girl logged onto his computer and found that he was a member of a website where people shared footage of unconscious or sleeping women being sexually abused. He took photo images of her and uploaded um, them, and so she obviously was able to identify herself in those photos, in those images. Another woman who had known Hugh for more than uh, five years discovered that he had taken 1,369 images and 195 videos of her while she was unconscious between 2016 and 2019. He previously told her about a number of women who have become sick at work it can't be a coincidence, she told him. He replied, maybe it was just bad luck. Hu, who was raised in central China as a son of a military officer and a police officer, came to Australia to study university. He told a psychiatrist he had developed a fetish and sexual interest in sedating, in the sedation of unconscious women. So, in you know, in like seducing them and having sex with unconscious women the first time he had sex with an unconscious woman it opened up the wrong door in my brain and i disregarded their safety i would like to know who this psychologist was because um it is their job i know they can't dob anyone in but but if they suspect 
that it is in the commission of a crime and or that he has hurt somebody previously, they can and should contact the police to get um, that person looked into. They can't tell the police what that person did, because especially without proof, but they can get them to... I know, I get it. It's patient, client, privilege, blah, 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 blah. And all of my psychology friends are now going to be screaming at me through this. No, Haley, that's not how it works. Anyway, so let's move on so I don't get in trouble from them. Um, the, so Judge Rort said that it's clear and that he accepted responsibilities for his conduct and felt self-loathing, fear and disgust and shame for his actions. No, he felt shame that he got caught. He didn't feel shame for his actions. No one films someone one person 1369 times sorry takes that many images and 195 videos of one person the rest was all you know other people and doesn't feel and just you know only feel shame when they get caught yeah you got you feel shame because you got caught now everyone knows you're a freaking sicko so um he was lacking empathy and i agree a particularly traumatic impact on his victims because he thought that because they were unconscious they would never know and therefore he did no harm to them he ordered um who to serve at least 22 years of a sentence and who's already spent three and a half years behind bars thank god but he will not be eligible for parole for another you know 19 or so years and hopefully he will not have access to any people after and I don't want to wish death on anyone but I hope that he dies in prison I just whispered that okay so support is available if you think that you might be one of his victims if you had him as a boss at some point um, he you can contact the sexual assault family domestic counseling service at 1800 respect that's 1-800-737-732 please do because, you know, you could be one of these million, <laughs> hundreds of women that he took videos and footage of. I mean, I really hope you're not. But, you know, it might explain a lot. Okie dokie, artichokey. Let's move on from that refreshing story to another story. Ba -ba -da, ba -ba 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 -ba. This one is not about a... Uh, it's a really quick one. And it's really like a breaking story, to be honest. The police are appealing for a young boy who was grabbed in a Western Sydney toilet block by a stranger. So at 12 o'clock today, that's the 12th of May, 2023, police are investigating a young boy was grabbed by a stranger in a toilet block in Sydney's West. The 10-year-old boy was at a scooter oval in Greenfield Park on Tuesday at around about 6.30 p.m. when an unknown man walked up behind him. The man grabbed him, but the boy managed to free himself and run away. He told his mother that about um, the reported incident, who in turn contacted police. So um, he has been found, this boy, obviously. He didn't get kidnapped or anything. He was just grabbed and not just, but he was grabbed and assaulted and he made, managed to make it back to his mum, thank goodness. So he's not, we don't need to find anybody, so just take that as a caveat. But what we're actually appealing for is anyone who has any dash cam footage of the area on Arrowhead Road in Greensfield Park between 4.30pm and 7pm on May 9th is urged to contact police. So anyone, I mean, I have a dash cam, if you've got a dash cam, most people have ga dash cams these days. I hope you don't have a dash cam, but most people have dash cams these days. So if you happen to be travelling on that road, which was, again, Arrowhead Road in Greenfield Park between 4.30pm and 7pm on May 9th, please contact police and hand over your dash cam footage because you might be able to catch this disgusting predator. Okie dokie. This next story is about two New South Wales police officers charged after um, a baby sustained non-accidental injuries. So two New South Wales police officers have been charged with a baby sustained an unexplained non-accidental injury in Sydney. The 38-year-old man, a senior constable, and a 37-year-old female senior constable were charged with two counts of perverting the course of justice after investigation had begun in July 2021. Both officers' employment status is under review. So that means they're pretty much sitting at home and getting paid. 
Um, so officers attached to the State Crime Command Child Abuse Squad and Professional Standards Commission, so PSC, established that strike forced um, uh, a strike force, sorry, to investigate reports of a nine-month-old baby who sustained an unexplained non-accidental injury, police have said in a statement. As part of these inquiries, PSC detectives established a strike force, uh, Greg, to investigate the conduct of two people known to the child. They are expected to uh, face court in Mount Jurat Court next month. And I really hope they have dash cam footage of the incident. And I really hope that they both lose their jobs. Um, I feel like we probably shouldn't have named them. I feel like that's not the way to go, considering that we hold them to a higher standard and therefore um, it's despicable what they have done. But, um, yeah, non-accidental. I wonder what they did to this poor child. Anyway, I should hopefully have some more information for you guys later. I know some of you really dislike these open-ended ones where I don't have any information, but unfortunately, like I said, I don't write the crime. But I could leave it to the side, I suppose, and talk about it later. But I like to talk about it now, when it's fresh in my mind. And I'll just do updates later. Yes, that was my uh, snowflake voice. You're welcome. I'm far from a snowflake. As you can tell, covered in tattoos. But yes, let us move on. And here is an interesting one. And it's unfolding again, so it's a nice little short one. And I apologise, but I don't. Sorry, not sorry. Police have found a mummified body in a Gold Coast home. How cool is that? So homicide detectives are investigating after a mummified, mummified, mummified body of a 69-year-old man was found in a home on the Gold Coast last month. Police suspect the man had died potentially years ago in his home where his wife and stepson also lived. When a relative came up from Canberra to visit but was denied entry into the home she called police um yeah so how weird is that so on April 17th officers came into the home in um Edinburgh Road in Benoit 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 and then they found the body so because of how long the 69-year-old man had been man had been dead, police have not yet been able to determine if his injuries uh, could indicate the cause of his death. So the investigations are still going. So do you want to hear my speculation? Well, you can't answer me, so you're going to. I speculate that they were getting some sort of pension for him and he probably died of natural causes and um, he might not have been a very nice person, or maybe he was a nice person, but they're very broke, and COVID killed everybody and made it a really difficult time for a lot of people financially. Not that I'm saying it's okay for what they did, and not that I'm saying that's what happened, but that's my speculation. My speculation is that they frauded, and not just because it's Fraud Friday, that they kept him in the bedroom, obviously, and um, kept cashing in his checks so I wouldn't be surprised if that's what they end up getting charged with um fraud as well so we'll see we'll see we will see um but yeah hopefully I'll have updates about that one for you guys as it unfolds but for now that's all there is there isn't any more okay let's move on shall we Moving on. So a woman has been jailed for sex with a 14-year-old male student. That's called rape. Just saying. It's not called sex when the child is 14. It's called rape. Oh, that really, really irks me. So I have a thing about words. I mean, I'm a writer, so of course I'm going to have a thing about words. And I think that words are really, really important. And I think we should choose the words that we use wisely because words can hurt way more than people give them credit for i mean how many times can you remember being told you were wonderful and fantastic probably rarely but how many times can you remember people saying something mean to you i can remain remember verbatim mean things that people have said to me that stick in my head and that you know those intrusive thoughts that come in everyone gets them and anyone who says they don't you're full of shit and what a privileged life you have lived if you have never been 
told something that offended you or upset you in any way. You know, people can be cruel, and children especially, but I actually found that it was the people, other people who hurt me the most. But let's get off the sad, hazy train. Um, when it comes to a child, it's not called sex anymore. It's called pedophilia or abuse or rape. But I have found that when news stories write about a woman being the predator, it seems to be that they had sex, like sex indicates um, that they there was consent there with that word. Um, but if it was a male perpetrator to a female or even a male victim, then it's classified as rape. No, everybody, male and female, they're rapists, guys, because they're underage and there was no consent given. And even if there was consent given, they can't give consent because they're 14. Anyway, so she's been jailed. So Azar, whatever her last name is, it's too long, guys, Raha. Ramazadeh Ramazade, Ramazade, began talking to 14 year old student on Snapchat over the summer holidays. All right, let me just get really real for a minute. Dear parents, stop letting your children on Snapchat. Stop letting them on 9MSN, whatever it is called these days. I think it's called Messenger, Facebook Messenger, 9MSN. Oh my god, that shows my age. Stop letting them on it. They don't have the frontal cortex reasoning and they don't have... It's just a giant way for them to be perpetrated and for people to get to them. Now, I know everyone's like, yes, but you've got to let your kids have independence. Yep, you can. There's messenger kids, in which case they can message each other. There is uh, private messages via text. A good old text message. It's a wonderful thing. Um... And I strongly believe that no child needs Snapchat. Just saying. I don't think anyone needs the ability to snap anybody else. I think adults shouldn't have Snapchat. I've seen some horrible things on Snapchat. In fact, I'm only on there because I have a friend who lives in Ireland and I like to talk to her. And that's the only reason I have Snapchat. Otherwise, I wouldn't have it myself. I just think that I don't think we should wrap our kids in cotton wool. Don't get me wrong. I think they should know the ways of the internet. I think they should know the reasons why you shouldn't let them have it. But I still think you shouldn't let them have it. I'm just saying. Too many stories. You're opening up the door for all of these people to come into their life. I mean, just watch one season of To Catch a Predator. Seriously. Just watch one season. Or, or read a memoir. Um, there's a memoir called... What's it called? Hold on. Oh, no. There's lots of them. Read a memoir that has, like... You know, the stories of how they were groomed on the internet by these people. And the thing is, is the internet is not a safe place. Yes, we can make it safe. Yes, we can talk to our children about these things. Yes, we can sort of solve these kinds of problems ourselves. But it's up to us as parents. And honestly, honestly, you're not your child's friend. You're their parent. You are their ch you, I mean, you can be friendly towards them. You can love them unconditionally like you do. But you're not their friend. You're not there to be their buddy. You're not there to be their pal. You're there to parent them. So stop. Just stop. Don't allow your f children, babies, to have these things. And I know there's going to be some parents out there who are saying, yeah, you're calling me a bad mom because I let my kid have Snapchat. No, you do you, boo. But what I'm saying is, is that you are opening up your child to a world that they don't have the comprehension nor the wherewithal to navigate. For example... If your 14-year-old child innocently puts up a Snapchat picture of them laying on the grass, right? Laying on the grass and they're wearing a low-cut top and they're just comfortably reading, okay? To you, that looks innocent and sweet and beautiful. And it is innocent, sweet and beautiful. And there's nothing wrong with that. But whoever opens up that Snapchat, you don't know who it's going to be. It could be some 40-year-old man who's just going to go out the back and... You know? sound effects are necessary or in this case a woman so now that i've gone off on that little tangent you're welcome anytime soon like i said guys i'm savage with my opinions don't like it you know dog on anyway so the melbourne teacher yes you heard that correctly enjoyed the boy's attention and invited him to her house for a drink a fucking drink of what alcohol he's 14 
After picking him up from the train station in her car, she told him to keep a low profile and hide as they drove to her home. Guys, I'm going to throw up. Blah, 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 blah. She allowed the boy to help himself to alcohol once they arrived. Do you know what that's called? That's called grooming. She then sat on his lap, kissed him, and had sex with the, boom, the boy in her bedroom. No, she didn't. She raped the boy in her bedroom. Use the right words. Um, his dad collected him and took him to his mother ho- mother's home where he cried. Of course he did. He was just assaulted. And the father picked him up? Did the dad know what was happening? In the weeks that followed, um, she sent the boy a number of messages on social media calling him handsome and her favourite student. Fucking love your guts forever. I'm truly sorry if I hurt you, she told him. Oh my god, she's the worst kind of predator. The boy didn't tell his mum what happened for months until he became so scared a video being shared around school could become public. The mother now feels that she failed to protect him. And that's what I'm saying, guys. You don't want to be there. You don't want to be the parent that feels like they failed to protect their child. So just don't. Or educate your child on the importance of what they share and how they interact with others because if you feel like your child really does need snapchat or they really do need it i don't know how i mean they can't convince me they do need it but um if you feel like that then maybe you need to uh educate them like as far as you can about people like this let them watch an episode of to catch a predator there's nothing gross on it it just tells you what they did you know, and they can see that in real life people do really turn up. No one, no 30-year-old woman or 30-year-old man wants to be a friend with a teenager unless they've got some ulterior sexual disgusting motive. Anyway, so <clears throat> the boy said that since his, since then he's been subjected to schoolyard ridicule Um and his lost friends, and when interviewed by the police, she blamed the boy. She later pled guilty to sexual penetration of a child under the age of 16. Um, He's very young, a child, and I wasn't thinking about the number, which is absolutely horrific. Yeah, you know, you weren't thinking how you got, we're going to get caught. You knew exactly what you were doing, you fucking bitch. Anyway... So the judge, Anne Hassan, said um, at the age of 44, yeah, you heard that correctly, she's had multiple chances to reflect on um, and avoid the disastrous consequences her offending had on that boy. Um, it was just disgusting, guys. It's just so disgusting. It involved a gross breach of trust. Before the offending, there was an embedded with sexual overtones. Your experienced teacher who knew what you were doing and you knew what you were doing was wrong. Um, She has been jailed for two and a half years. It's just not enough time, guys. It's just not enough time. Um, And she'll be eligible for, for parole after serving just one year, just 12 months. It's just not enough time. People are not going to prison for long enough for abusing children. It's just ridiculous and disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Anyway, so he handed her a shorter sentence because of her mental turmoil and despair about her offending. Oh, fuck off. She was lonely after living in COVID-19 lockdowns on her own. And burnt out after her teaching workload had increased. These are none of these are okay. Um, She has had the extra punishment of losing her career, reputation, her home and being subjected to media coverage. She will be a registered sex offender for 15 years. She should be a registered sex offender for the rest of her days. She should go where all registered sex offenders of children should go and that is hell. You're disgusting. Disgust me and you make me feel sick. 
And I honestly, honestly, honestly think that you're the worst kind of offender. I hate pedophiles. I don't care what gender they are. I hate them all. It's disgusting. Alrighty, let's move on. To another teacher who's been jailed over sexual abuse material. So, I would like to point out, reiterating my statement before. She was charged with having sex, having sex with a minor. He, yeah, the teacher is a he, the, the subtitle is student teacher jailed over sexual abuse material. So hers wasn't sexual abuse, it was having sex with a minor, and his is sexual abuse. See, this is the importance of words, guys. It's really, really, really important. And I know people are like, no one reads into it like that. It doesn't matter. It subversively reads into read goes into your brain. You think that these cases are least are less scary or less horrible because of the language they have chosen to use. I couldn't think of a more horrible case. That poor kid. Anyway, I want to move on from that one. Let's go on to this one. And I I'm sorry about that. I just got a little bit upset. He's spaghetti. So, again, I just want to reiterate that this story contains references of sexual abuse, including details and content that some readers may find distressing. I like how this one had it, but the other one didn't have that warning. So, former Sydney high school teacher who downloaded videos of children being held at gunpoint for his own sexual pleasure, so he didn't actually rape anyone, not that that makes it okay, she raped someone, uh, will spend at least 18 months behind bars. So Cody Mitchell Reynolds, 37, pled guilty in December to one charge of transmitting sexual abuse material and another charge of processing it, of possessing it. The former um, Mariah College English teacher home was raided in March of 2022 where police found a WhatsApp message thread call from a man named Xavier. The pair shared videos of children being held at gunpoint um, and boys as young as four masturbated um, and being sexually abused. Investor, investigators also found 111 images. Sorry. 111 images and six videos of children being abused in a hidden folder on his camera roll, as well as his work issued laptop. He was immediately stood down from his position at the top Sydney's private school and no offences were alleged to have been committed involving the college students. People like the offender who access and possess children child abuse material encourage and feed on the abhorrent market and I agree. Um, he has said that he took into account Reynolds' history and his guilty plea and said it was a clear message that must be sent. In affluent, the former teacher pled uh, pled for no prison time, but accepted that he lost his place for that in the decision. He said that he'll be leaving work at the Sydney College. He would be in the apartment drinking alcohol and watching child abuse material and delayed returning home. The judge agreed that Reynolds has proactively been seeking psychological help since his arrest. Yeah, just, just to placate the system. He um, expressed an overwhelming, genuine remorse for his conduct. No, he didn't. He's just remorseful that he got caught. Um, he got 10 months, guys. 10 months in jail with a non-parole period of one year and six months. So that's after. Reynolds, who's been on bail since the arrest, showed little emotion when he was led out of courts in handcuffs. He will be eligible to be released in November of 2024. That's nice, isn't it? That's nice how he, how one person abused a teenage boy and only got two years, and will only have to, you know, spend one of them in prison, basically. And this guy got ten months. It's just absolutely ridiculous and just too, too lease of a. I feel like, yeah, it's too less of a charge, guys. It's just too less of a charge, and it makes me feel really, really sick. Okie dokie. I think I've got one more story for today and then we should be done with this. Just give me a second. I need to have a quick change of wool. Actually, I don't think I will change the wool because I'm almost done. I will have a quick uh, drink of coffee. Give me a second. 
Okie dokie, so this last one is a really quick one, but also about rape, but this time of adults. So a man has been extradited from South Australia to Queensland to face 25 historical rape charges. So a 75-year-old man has been extradited from South Australia to Queensland to face more than two dozens of accusations of rape and other offences dating back decades. Queensland police said the man was arrested about eight hours' drive from Adelaide on Tuesday. The man, who can't be named for legal reasons, will be extradited to Cairns on Thursday. He faces 25 counts of rape, 11 counts of indecent assault, and one count of deprivation of liberty. For those of you who don't know, that means pretty much he kept somebody at home. Um, The alleged incidents were reported to police in October 2021 and date back to 1978 and 1979. So it eventually does catch up with you if you're a criminal. I hate you. Um, A police spokesperson said that there was believed to be more than one alleged victim and the 75-year-old will be remanded in custody to face Cairns Magistrate Court again on Friday. So again today. Um, If you need any support, please call 1-800-RESPECT or 1-800-737-732. Okay, guys, that is me for the day. I am done. I'm a little bit agitated about the um, child sexual abuse stuff that I just read out before, as you can tell by my fiddly hands. And so I'm probably just going to go and do a couple more rows in this blanket on my couch and contemplate my navel, if you will. I thank you very much for your time and your patience today, and I hope to see you guys tomorrow. Have a wonderful day. Bye!